Welcome. Welcome to online worship. Now let me start off by saying happy Father's Day. Hey dads, I uh, really hope that you get uh, treated like royalty this weekend. You know, every uh, day, every week for sure, we are seeing uh, shocking headlines, uh, big stories, and uh, stories of unrest, uh, stories of COVID hotspots, and uh, every day we get these, uh, these big stories. Well, today in worship, we are going to see a big headline. We're going to see a shocking headline. Remember King Ahab? Well, he's the most wicked king. He sold himself uh, to do evil. And then something dramatic happens. And you would not believe this shocking headline, this big story, if it were not told to you by God through Elijah. This is what God tells Elijah. The word of the Lord came to Elijah saying, have you seen how Ahab has humbled himself before me? What? King Ahab, this wicked king, humbles himself before God? Well, that's the big story. That's the big headline. And that's where we're gonna go in worship this morning. Come be sinners, poor and needy. We can wound it, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you with compassion, love, and power. Come ye thirsty to the fountain, come and find his goodness here. True belief in true repentance. Every grace that brings you near. I will rise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me as his own. In the arms of my Savior, there is life.
a confessing people. We want to be a people who confess the truth about ourselves and the truth about our God. So let's take a moment to, uh, to confess, a call to confession. Psalm 94, could it be that he who implanted the ear does not hear, or that he who formed the eye does not see? And then from Ezekiel, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they would turn from their ways and live. In Luke 15, there is more rejoicing over one who repents than over the 99 who do not see a need. So let's confess sin together. Merciful God, you pardon all those who truly repent and turn to you. We humbly confess our sins and ask for your mercy. We have not loved you with a pure heart, nor have we loved our neighbor as ourselves. We have not done justice, loved kindness, or walked humbly with you, our God. Have mercy on us, O God. In your loving kindness, in your great compassion, cleanse us from all of our sin. Now together, if you will, give us clean hands. Create in us pure hearts, O God and renew a right spirit within us. Do not cast us from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. Sustain us with your bountiful spirit through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Now we will sing an assurance of pardon. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord.
thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins they are many, His mercy is no Our summer sermon series is taking us through the stories of Elijah and Elisha in the Old Testament. Last week, Ray preached on Elijah in a, a state of despair and despondency and how God met him in a still, small voice. And one of the applications of that was that God is always at work. God is always at work. Last weekend, someone came up after the service, uh, found right, said, this was my first weekend, my first time here. I cannot believe that you just preached that sermon. That was, you, you hit things that I have been thinking about for the last 30 years. God is always at work. You know, it's, it's something that we're blown away by uh, all the time. And this weekend is another example most of our sermon series go through the books of the Bible. And so just whatever the next chapter, whatever the next section is, that's what we preach on. Or even if we're preaching um, not exactly in order or if we're going through topically, we set these sermons uh, months in advance. Uh, and so God knew that this passage would be preached this weekend because God is always at work. What did God want? for us to hear from this passage tonight? Well, this passage of scripture uh, is about greed. Uh, it's about uh, abuse of power and idolatry, 
that leads to the unjust treatment and death of an innocent man. It's about the truth of God's word calling us to repentance. And ultimately, it's about Jesus. It's about his, how through his life, death, and resurrection, he takes injustice upon himself and brings the justice for which our world longs. Lecrae Moore is a Grammy award-winning Christian rapper. He says this, he says, as Christians, when we read the Bible, we recognize that events that happened thousands of years ago are still relevant today. We also see that scripture never hides the ugly parts of history when it comes to the people of God. So Cassidy Harper is going to read uh, 1 Kings chapter 21 for us, and we're going to see how the Bible doesn't hide this ugly part uh, of uh, the history of people God, of, of God, but rather records it so that we can learn and apply it to our lives today. Uh, so if you're willing, Abel, please stand. 1 Kings 21. Now Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard in Jezreel beside the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And after this, Ahab said to Naboth, give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden because it's near my house and I'll give you a better vineyard for it or if it seems good to you, I'll give you its value in money. But Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. And Ahab went into his house vexed and sullen because of what Naboth the Jezreelite had said to him, for he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down on his bed and he turned his face away and would eat no food. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, why is your spirit so vexed that you eat no food? And he said to her, because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and said to him, give me your vineyard for money or else if it please you, I'll give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. And Jezebel, his wife, said to him, do you now govern Israel? Arise and eat bread and let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal. And she sent the letters to the elders and the leaders who lived with Naboth in his city. And she wrote in the letters, proclaim a fast and set Naboth, at the head of the people and set two worthless men opposite him and let them bring a charge against him saying, you have cursed God and the king and then take him out and stone him to death. And the men of his city, the elders and the leaders who lived in his city did as Jezebel had sent word to them. As it was written in the letters that she had sent to them, they proclaimed a fast and set Naboth at the head of the people and the two worthless men came in and sat opposite him. And the worthless men brought a charge against Naboth in the presence of the people saying, Naboth cursed God and the king. So they took him outside the city and stoned him to death with stones. And then they sent to Jezebel saying, Naboth has been stoned, he is dead. As soon as Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money, for Naboth is not alive but dead. And as soon as Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, Ahab rose to go down to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite to take possession of it. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, Go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone to take possession. And you shall say to him, thus says the Lord, have you killed and also taken possession? And you shall say to him, thus says the Lord, in the place where dogs lift up the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick your own blood. Ahab said to Elijah, have you found me, O my enemy? And he answered, I have found you because you have sold yourself to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring disaster upon you. I will utterly burn you up and will cut off from Ahab every male, bond or free in Israel. 
and I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah, for anger to which you have provoked me, and because you have made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel, the Lord also said, the dog shall eat Jezebel within the walls of Jezreel. Anyone belonging to Ahab who dies in the city, the dog shall eat. And any one of his who dies in the open country, the birds of the heavens shall eat. There was none who sold himself to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord like Ahab, whom Jezebel his wife incited. He acted very abom abominably in going after idols as the Amorites had done, whom the Lord cast out before the people of Israel. And when Ahab heard those words, he tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about dejectedly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite saying, have you seen how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the disaster in his days, but in his son's days, I will bring the disaster upon his house. All right, amen. You may be seated, please. Thank you, Cassidy. I want to talk about three truths that I believe come out of this passage in 1 Kings 21. The sources of injustice, the systems of injustice, and the solutions for injustice. But before we dive in, we need to lay some groundwork. Just talking about justice and injustice in the cultural climate in which we live is uncomfortable. It makes us uncomfortable and that's okay. We need to be uncomfortable because our discomfort is an indication that God is at work. Our discomfort is a sign that our idols are being exposed and that's a good thing. And particularly for us, the idol of politics. We live in a culture that unhelpfully politicizes everything. And what is the result of that? Tribalism, fear, and anger. Instead of sitting in the uncomfortable moments and listening to one another, we retreat to our corners and we throw up our walls and we start lobbing statistics and accusations at each other like hand grenades. And all that happens is the divide between us grows deeper and deeper. We, uh, we go on Facebook and we have wars in the comments section. And when, the, when this happens in the church, the world just looks at us and says, see, they're no different. Listen, issues of race and poverty do not belong to liberals. And issues of abortion and marriage do not belong to conservatives because they are all justice issues and therefore they are all gospel issues. Jesus will always be too liberal for conservatives and too conservative for liberals because God is not beholden to any political party. This passage that we read from 1 Kings 21 can be the beginning of gospel conversations in our homes and in our small groups and in our church and, and in our community if we are willing to put down our walls and listen. Are you willing to do that tonight? Holy Spirit, help us. Help us to do that. An innocent man, a human being created in the image of God with dignity and value and worth is falsely accused and murdered because of a vineyard. And it's actually worse. Second Kings 9 tells us that it was not only Naboth, but his sons who were also executed. This is injustice. This is not the way that things are supposed to be. Where did this injustice originate from? Why did it happen? What are the sources of injustice? You know, there are lots of sources of injustice in our world, but this passage shows us at least three, three sources of injustice. One source of injustice is greed. 
Ahab was the, the king of the, the, the northern kingdom of Israel. Ahab, we've met Ahab before in his encounters with Elijah. Ahab was an evil king, uh, a wicked king, but he was a productive king. There had been a drought in the land, but now the drought was over. And Ahab was working hard to expand his kingdom and to, uh, to grow his personal wealth. Ahab had two palaces. The main palace was in Samaria. This palace was in Jezreel. This was Ahab's winter retreat, and it was magnificent. One preacher I heard said that if, if Ahab subscribed to a magazine, his magazine would be Homes and Gardens. Um, Naboth, on the other hand, was a commoner, and he had the unfortunate priv- uh, providence of owning a vineyard next to Ahab's palace. And just like King David, when he was on his balcony, looked out and he saw Bathsheba and, and decided that he had to have her, even though she was another man's wife. And uh, Ahab looks out and sees the vineyard of Naboth and says, I need a place to plant my vegetables. But Ahab's language is the language of money. And when money is your language, then everything has a price. And so Ahab goes to Naboth and he says, give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden because it's near my house and and I'll give you a better vineyard for it. Or if it seems good to you, I'll give you its value and money. I mean, here is Naboth's chance, right? This is what you, this is what you hope for. You buy a piece of land and you strike oil, right? The, the, The turnpike comes through and your house doubles in value. Naboth can make a killing. But Naboth doesn't think the same way that Ahab does. Naboth has a different system of values. The Lord forbid, he says, that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. Naboth is referring to the Old Testament in which it says that that all of the earth... Uh, belongs to God and, uh, and it's his and yet he gave this particular land of Israel to his people when he brought them out of Egypt. He, he gave them the land as an inheritance and, and as families, each family has a, a right uh, to their inherited land to pass down uh, through the generations. That's why Naboth says, Lord forbid that I do this. In a sense, he's, he's calling out the king. He's saying, you should know better than to even ask such a question. And so how does Ahab respond? It says, he went into his house, vexed and sullen. He, he lay down on his bed and turned away his face and he would eat no food. What does that sound like to you? It sounds like a child, right? A child who is who's throwing a tantrum because he, he can't get uh, what he wants. You parents know what I'm talking about. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said, why is your spirit so vexed that you eat no food? What's going on? He says to her, because I spoke to Naboth, the Jezreelite, and I I said to him, give me your vineyard for money, or I'll say, please, I'll give you another vineyard for it. And he said, I will not give you my vineyard. Hmm." You see, greed, in this case, Coveting a vineyard is one of the sources of injustice that ends up being visited upon Naboth and his family. Isn't it the case that greed is often a source of injustice in our world today? We have a saying that saying is money talks. The problem with that is that when money becomes the official language of a culture, then injustice is sure to be lurking in the shadows. You know, is making money bad? No. Is working for what you get bad? No. But shouldn't it concern us that in America, racial inequality and economic inequality go hand in glove? Take take this for instance. The, the, The net worth of the average black family in America, you take their their positives and their negatives, you add them together, at the end of the day, their total net worth, the average black family in America is $17,000, okay? The average net worth 
typical white family in America is $171,000. 10 times the amount. Shouldn't that draw some attention? That's not just because somebody's not working hard enough. It's because there's inequality, injustice. You know, when you drive through a minority neighborhood, one of the things that always stands out to me, it strikes me, is what do you see an abundance of? Payday loan companies, right? Places where uh, the, the poorest, right, of the poor, the people who, who can't afford to pay high interest rates are, are given the opportunity to get money at, at these exorbitant rates, uh, and it, it only keeps them uh, in that uh, oppression. In an unjust society, the rich get richer at the expense of the poor. Greed has always been a source of injustice. And not only greed, but abuse of power is also a source of injustice. We see it illustrated here in the text. How does Jezebel respond to her husband Ahab? She says, do you now govern Israel? Arise, eat bread, let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. Translation, what's the matter with you? You're the king. Get up, quit being a baby. If you're not going to be a man, if you're not going to man up and do what needs to be done, I'll do it. And where did, where did Jezebel get this, this way of thinking? She got it from her father. Her father was the king of Tyre. You see, pagan kings, that's what they did. They abused their power. What did Ahab and Jezebel do to earn the power they had? Nothing. They were born into it. They could have been born like Naboth, but instead they were born as royals, and as such they had the responsibility not to abuse their power, but to leverage it for the good of others. When greed and abuse of power combine, then Naboth goes from being a person made in the image of God who has inherent dignity and value and worth to an, op- to an object that is an obstacle in the way and can be removed by any means necessary. In any culture, those who hold the power, those who hold the social capital are easily tempted to abuse their power to the detriment of others. Rather than following the example of Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he, he humbled himself. He took on the form of a servant. But greed and abuse of power and any other source of injustice are ultimately, uh, they all flow from one source, one ultimate source of injustice, and that is idolatry in the human heart. Twice in this passage, it, it says of Ahab that he sold himself to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord. What does that mean? He sold himself to do what was evil. It's the, the language of, of, uh, of becoming a debtor, right? of, of selling yourself uh, into the, the, uh, the slavery of, of debt to another person. Paul picks up this language in Romans 7 when he says, I am of the flesh sold under sin. You see, at the heart of sin, Uh, is that instead of worshiping God, we worship idols. Instead of worshiping the creator, we worship created things. What is the first commandment? I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. Ahab had married a pagan, Jezebel, and together Ahab and Jezebel had set about leading the entire nation to worship other gods. You remember from last week, Elijah, that was his issue. He, he thought, I'm the only one left. I'm the only one who hasn't sold themselves to idolatry. But God says to him, no, I've, I've kept 7,000 in Israel who haven't, who haven't bent the knee to Baal. Naboth was one of those 7,000, one who, was, who had not sold himself to the idols. About 130 years after Ahab, the northern kingdom was exiled, uh, conquered by the Assyrians, and God tells them why. In 2 Kings 17, he says, 
This occurred because the people of Israel sinned against their Lord, their God. They, they did wicked things, provoking the Lord to anger. They served idols for which the Lord had said to them, you shall not do this. They went after false idols and became false. Fascinating language. They, they went after false idols and they became false. They followed the nations that were around them and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. John Calvin famously said that the human heart is an idol factory, constantly churning out other gods for us to worship. Money, sex, power, career, happiness. And when we sell ourselves to idols, when we follow false gods, we become false. Idolatry is the ultimate source of any injustice in the world because worship and ethics always go together. Ethics flows out of your worship. And the most destructive idol of all is the idol of self. Will we make ourselves, our feelings, our thoughts, our desires, our comforts, our interests, our glory, the center of our lives? Or will we make what God says, his glory, his kingdom central? One leads to injustice. The other leads as a source to justice. Second, not only do we see the the sources of injustice in this passage, but this passage also shows us that there can be systems of injustice. The, The sin of idolatry is in every one of us. We are all individually responsible for it, but our individual sin becomes part of a larger system when combined with the sins of others. You see that here in this story. It wasn't just Ahab and Jezebel. Look again at verses eight through 11. So Jezebel wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal. She sent the letters to the elders and the leaders who lived with Naboth in his city. And she wrote in the letters, proclaim a fast and set Naboth at the head of the people and set two worthless men opposite him and let them bring a charge against him saying, you've cursed God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. And the men of his city, the elders and the leaders who lived in his city, did as Jezebel sent word to them. In this story, there are, there are two unjust systems that contribute to Naboth's death and the death of his sons. First, there's an unjust legal system. Ahab and Jezebel, they use their power and wealth to manipulate the legal process, and Naboth is helpless to fight against it. Documents are forged. False witnesses are rounded up. Uh, the elders and the leaders who lived in Naboth's city, the ones who were, who were supposed to protect him, the ones who were, who were there to uh, represent him, uh, to do the very opposite. And in, in the ancient world, when someone was stoned to death, it wasn't just the leaders who did it. The entire city would be involved. You see, the entire system in Naboth's town was broken. And we shouldn't really be surprised, should we? What are we saying when we talk about systemic evil or systemic injustice? We're simply saying that sinners make up systems and systems, when they're made up of sinners, will always be imperfect, always be flawed, always be broken, sometimes a little and sometimes a lot. What about our own legal system? Are we willing to recognize injustice and fight against it? Brian Stevenson uh, is, uh, started the Equal Justice Initiative and for, for over 25 years has been fighting for injustice for those who are uh, in our criminal system, particularly in the state of Alabama. And as a church, we went and watched the movie Just Mercy. If you haven't watched that movie, I'd encourage you, it's free for the month of June. Uh, pull up on on any kind of of the platforms available and watch Just Mercy. But Brian Stevenson was giving a talk, a TED talk, and he said this, in 1972, there were 300,000 people in jails and prisons. Today, there are 2.3 million. 
The United States now has the highest rate of incarceration in the world. We have 7 million people on probation and parole. In poorer communities and communities of color, there is this despair, there is this hopelessness that is being shaped by these outcomes. One out of three black men between the ages of 18 and 30 is in jail, in prison, on probation, or parole. In urban communities across this country, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, 50 to 60% of all young men of color are in jail or in prison or on probation or parole. We have a system of justice in this country that treats you much better if you are rich and guilty than if you are poor and innocent. In this country, in the states of the Old South, we execute people where you are 11 times more likely to get the death penalty if the victim is white than if the victim is black, 22 times more likely to get it if the defendant is black and the victim is white, in the very states where they are buried in the ground the bodies of people who were lynched. I encourage you to, to Google Brian Stevenson TED Talk. It's about 20 minutes long, uh, and, uh, and we'll will open your eyes. We see in this passage here an unjust legal system, but there's something perhaps even more jarring in this passage. There's also an unjust religious system. What does Jezebel do? On behalf of the king, she calls for a fast. Why would Jewish kings call for fasts? Because it was a sign that something was wrong. There was sin in the camp and it had to be figured out. And so the king would call for a fast. Jezebel calls for a fast and, and, and she also um, asks for two false witnesses to be brought forward. Why two? Because the law of God said that not just on the testimony of one, but on two, something would be established. Jezebel knew, religious, uh, knew Jewish religion and she used it as a veneer to cover up injustice. Has Christianity, has the church ever been used as a veneer for covering injustice? Holocaust? Uh, slavery? Segregation? Apartheid? The Catholic sex abuse scandal? We should be sad, but we should not be surprised because churches too are made up of sinners and religion too can be part of a system that leads to injustice. Our own denomination, the PCA, which is essentially the, the Presbyterian Church of the South is learning to acknowledge and, and repent of um, our contribution um, to uh, neglecting uh, the civil rights movement and not coming alongside of our black brothers and sisters during segregation. Um, and, and it's something that's affected our denomination to this very day. It's the reason why we're predominantly white denomination. Um, but God is, is opening our eyes to see it. So we've diagnosed some of the sources and the systems of injustice. So last then, what are the solutions for injustice? Well, what do we see in this text? God is seemingly absent in the first half of the story. Ahab sulks, Jezebel plots, the system is rigged, and Naboth and his sons are murdered, and it looks like there's no justice. No one is going to be held accountable. And then you get to verse 17. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, God speaks, and he renders his verdict. He calls out the injustice. The first solution to injustice is the word of the Lord. As the theologian Francis Schaeffer famously said, God is there and he is not silent. How do we know what is right and what is wrong? How do we know what is just and what is unjust? God reveals it to us in his word. Brothers and sisters, if we want to be a people who are committed to justice and committed to fighting injustice, then, then we need to be a people who read the Bible more than we read the news. We need to be a people who listen to God's word more than we listen to talk radio. Because when you're, 
when you soak in the word of God, right, the word of God gives you lenses. It gives you a filter in order to sort through the noise in the fog of pain and politics and to be an unbiased reconciling force in this moment. God speaks through the prophet Elijah and his word is to Ahab. He's, he, Ahab is standing in Naboth's vineyard and, vineyard and, and Elijah brings the word of God to him and says, this is not going to go well for you. Right, I'm going to bring disaster upon you. I'm going to burn you up. I'll cut you off. Jezebel uh, and, uh, and you, your blood will be licked up by dogs. Uh, God brings his judgment, his, his verdict upon Ahab and Jezebel. And then the author of 1 Kings gives us, the reader, this aside summary of King Ahab. It says, There was none who sold himself to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord, like Ahab, whom Jezebel's wife incited. He acted very abominably in going after idols. No one was as bad as King Ahab. So it's clear to everyone, Ahab is a bad guy. He's got no excuse. God is going to drop the hammer of justice on him and he's going to get what he deserves. And then what happens next might be one of the most surprising things in the whole Bible says, and Ahab heard these words. He tore his clothes. He put sackcloth on his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about dejectedly. And the word of the Lord came again to Elijah and said, have you seen how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he's humbled himself before me, I will not bring this disaster in his days, but in his son's days, I will bring the disaster upon his house. Ahab repents and God shows him mercy. What? No! Where is the justice in that? Notice God, he doesn't cancel the judgment, but he, he delays it because of Ahab's repentance. There's actually another time in the Bible when it says a king of Israel humbled himself when he was confronted by the word of God. And because he did that, God responded by delaying his judgment. Do you know who that king of Israel was? It was King Josiah. King Josiah was considered the best king that the northern kingdom ever had. The best king they ever had and the worst king they ever had. Both of them humbled themselves and repented and God delayed his judgment had mercy on them. You know, um, God calls us to repent. God calls Derek Chauvin to repent for the murder of George Floyd. But he also calls me to repent. He calls me to repent of my prejudice. I need to humble myself and realize that I have often not spoken against systems where there is injustice. I have used my Hispanic roots when it benefited me, but truthfully, I am treated like the majority culture and have never felt as if I lacked any power or social capital. I have more often than not isolated myself from the poor and marginalized, and I have found it easier to speak about injustice rather than to actually do justice. Brothers and sisters, why do we get so defensive? Why are we so afraid of weakness? Our repentance and our humility will be what gives the church a real voice in this moment because our world has no category for it. God is a God of justice. Ahab and his sons and Jezebel are eventually killed as God prophesied. But he is also a God of mercy. And how do we receive mercy? By humbling ourselves, by repenting. God, in this story, I am not Naboth. I am Ahab. I am Jezebel. I am one of the worthless men who gave false testimony. I repent. I repent of my idolatry. And God will accept our repentance. Why? Because he's provided the ultimate solution to injustice. And this story points to it. 
Naboth is a picture of Jesus. Can you see it? Naboth was a faithful common Israelite who was falsely accused. He was taken outside of the city and executed. Jesus was the king, but he humbled himself and became one of us. He was the only one who was completely faithful to God his entire life. And what did he get for it? He was falsely accused, trumped up charges by an unjust system. He was taken outside the city and crucified. God's answer to all the injustices of our world was to come and take the injustice upon himself. He died for our greed, for our abuse of power, for our idolatry, for all of our sins of commission and omission. John Newton was a slave ship master. He was part of a system of injustice. But then he met Jesus and he wrote these words, let us wonder grace and justice join and point to mercy's store. When through grace in Christ our trust is, justice smiles and asks no more. And through Christ, through the Holy Spirit at work in him, Newton became one of the leaders of abolitionism in the British Empire. Jesus calls his followers to work for justice. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God offers mercy, he offers grace. He is currently delaying judgment, but not forever. One day Jesus will come back and he will fully and finally establish justice on the earth. That is what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. meant when he said the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. One day God will right every wrong, every wrong. One day there will be no more injustice. One day there will be no more broken systems. One day there will be no more division because one day all the redeemed from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages will stand together and we will cry with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. Chris Wright is a theologian. He was giving a conference in India and a guy who was a doctor and a university professor came up and he was so excited. He said, I'm so excited that you're gonna be preaching from the Old Testament because I became a Christian through reading the Old Testament. He said, I, I grew up in India in a, in a poor community that was oppressed and marginalized. And because of that, uh, all I wanted to do was find a way to get my own power and to, to turn that back on those who had oppressed me. And so I uh, you know, got into the uh, ideologies of Marxism and communism and I was, uh, I was trying my, the best that I could to right these injustices in my life. And he said, when I was in college, someone, uh, some Christians gave me a Bible and he said, I didn't believe it, but I figured I might as well read it to say that I did. And he opened it up. And one of the very first stories that he read in the Bible was 1 Kings 21 about Ahab and Naboth. And he said he read this story and he saw greed, abuse of power, unjust systems. He saw an, an innocent man uh, being murdered. And he saw a God who spoke into that and said, it is wrong. And I'm going to set that wrong right. And as he went on to, to read the Bible, he, he encountered Jesus. And he realized, if God is a God of justice, and if God is a God of mercy, that's the kind of God that I want to follow. Brothers and sisters, we have an opportunity because our culture is crying out for justice. Will we point them to the one who is both just and merciful? Let's pray. Hey, a couple of announcements. Um, we had asked folks to contribute to Camp Seven Rivers for scholarships for kids to go to camp. And we had asked the church specifically for $5,000. Well, you guys, went above and beyond. You did three times that amount, uh, 15,000. So just thank you and, and way to go, uh, Seven Rivers Church. Also, Brandon has already mentioned via email that this summer we would like to uh, read a book together. 
And the book is called uh, Dear a White Christian by Aaron Layton. The book is just five bucks. And then later on, towards the end of July, we're gonna have some discussion groups via Zoom or in person. And again, that's just in our continuous effort to listen, to learn, to lament, and to leverage uh, in a time of unrest in our country. So uh, the benediction. In the, uh, the passage that Brandon preached, at the end it said, the word of the Lord came to Elijah saying, have you seen how Ahab humbled himself before me? That was the big story in Israel. The big story. Will it be the big story in your life? Will you humble yourself? Will you walk humbly before the face of God? I want you to hear the words of this benediction, the words uh, uh, that, in a prayer. So if you'd bow your heads and hear these words from Psalm 139. Search me, O God, know my heart. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, test my thoughts. See if there is any grievous way in me. Anything that grieves you, Lord, anything that makes you sad, and lead me in the everlasting way. Amen.